understand that, but but y but you are attacking people who uh, who would like to lead us and tell us how the world works. No, no, they, no, no. They don't want to tell us how the world works. They want. To they want to take over the decision for us. They don't tell the parents how they ought to teach sex education to their children. They put this material in the schools behind the backs of the parents with instructions not to let the parents see it. The problems that we see in the world are due to the fact that other people are just not as bright or as compassionate as they are. Uh, and that there are all these solutions out there waiting to be discovered and that they have them. And that these solutions that are being imposed upon the rest of us uh, by, by the power of government through taxation or in other ways. Uh, and what's really crucial about it is that their passion is so, so much greater than the passion on the other side, largely because what they have involved is more. Well, who are the anointed? They're the elite in the media, in, the po in politics. Uh, all of those who think that third parties ought to be making people's decisions for them. The subtitle is self-congratulation as a basis for social policy. In other words, people who think that everything that's wrong with the, the country is due to the fact that other people are just not as smart as they are. And if only they could, you know, or people like them could take over and make our decisions, we'd be so much better off. Who is the they? Oh, the, 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 um, the media elite, the uh, academic elite, political elites. And, I, and the reason we can talk about their vision, even though they obviously vary in their opinions, uh, is that the basic set of underlying assumptions about the world are very similar. Um, and because these assumptions are the prevailing assumptions, uh, the need to find evidence for them or to offer proof is much less. If something, ha if something happens, they'll explain it in a way which will fit that vision. For example, uh, when they find that um, prenatal care is less among blacks than among whites and that um, infant mortality rates are higher, uh, they immediately assume this is because of society's neglect and therefore if only the government will step in and provide more prenatal care, that, that problem solves itself. But in reality, uh, other groups have even less prenatal care than blacks and don't have any more infant mortality than whites. Uh, but they don't ever get to that second stage because once they've seen something that fits their conception of how the world works, that's sort of the end of it. Uh, let, let me go back to that idea of who the they is. So you got the New York Times, the Washington Post, Harvard, Stanford, all the usual suspects. I think that when people say things like, uh, more American wives are battered on Super Bowl Sunday, you see, than any other time of the year. Uh, and, and there's not a speck of evidence for that. Uh, that is calculated. Because you, they're, they're, you they're, they're, oh, I mean, you, somebody, there, there, is, there is no data that could even be misinterpreted that way. In other words, because there is no data, period. And so, yes, but I think that 99% of the people who believe it are not calculating. Mm -hmm. So, and, I think, and I think one of the reasons that it flies without, without even being challenged for evidence mm -hmm. is that there is a certain vision of how the world is. And in that world, men are oppressing women. And therefore, when you say something like this, it fits the vision. And that's the end of it. There's no, there's no demand for evidence. There's a four-stage uh, 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 pattern. And in the first stage, is what, what's what I call the crisis. And so we're hyped to believe that something is a terrible crisis for which something must be done. Uh, and uh, what, was, what was fascinating to me in doing the research for the book is that very often the thing that's said to be in crisis has often been getting better for years on end, but that gets ignored. Then the second stage for, is... For example, infant mortality, to, to use one of well, the things uh, that I'm, 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 I'm thinking about um, um, uh, preg uh, teenage pregnancy and, and venereal disease. Uh, those things were getting better. Teenage pregnancy was going down for more than a decade before sex education was introduced. Venereal disease, uh, syphilis in 1960, uh, was only ha had only half the incidence that it had in 1950. So all these things are going down, yet, yet we're said to need sex education to deal with this crisis, which is then manufactured. And again, this is where the calculated part comes in. Now, 99% of the people who hear this don't, un don't know that. And, but, but the reason they accept it is because they also share the same vision. And because this is consonant with that vision, they don't have to ask for evidence. All right, so what's, what's stage two? Th that stage two is the... The, the first one is there's a crisis. Yes. They establish a crisis, usually an artificial one. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, then, then stage two is the solution. You have a solution for this crisis. In this case, you have sex education in the schools. And then uh, at that point, you say, if, if we do this, this will lead to beneficial result A. The critics say, no, it will lead to detrimental result Z. Stage three, you put it in the results, you put it in and directly you find detrimental results Z, namely venereal disease and teenage pregnancy take off into the stratosphere. 
And then stage four is the fascinating part, in which they simply say, no, that doesn't prove that this was a bad policy because there are many factors. There's complexity. It's simplistic to blame it on this. But they run through this routine on so many different things, including crime. Similarly, they said, you know, in 1960, uh, Judge Bazelon said we just desperately need to have some kind of change in the criminal justice system. Now, in 1960, uh, there were fewer murders than there had been in 1950, 1940, or 1930. Uh, but again, that was completely ignored. And so now we have the revolution in the criminal justice system. People say, no, if you have to put these new things in, there'll be more crime than before. They put them in. Uh, almost instantly, the declining crime rate turns around and heads up again. And they say, no, it's simplistic to blame this on, on this. There are the root causes and the neglect of society and all the rest of it. So it's heads I win, tails you lose. You think the increase in uh, venereal disease was caused by, by sex education? I don't education? have to even say that. I don't even have to, have to believe that. All but, I have to say but is do they, you? But do you? Oh, I think, I, I think it's, it's hard to explain otherwise. I mean, you, know, you don't get social changes that drastic in a, in a few years without some particular cause. But I, I, that, that, the argument doesn't depend on that at all. The point is, they created the crisis artificially. The evidence shows there was no crisis. Uh, and when, and, but they would not sub even subject it to any empirical test. If they want to show some other fact that came in and really caused this, I'm happy to hear that. Now, w w why would a group of, of liberal intellectuals or politicians or media stars or whatever, why would they sit around and decide to uh, uh, dismember or dilute the criminal justice system if they thought in advance that it would raise the amount of criminality. Oh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't think that, but the point is... They just thought wrongly that it would, be, that it would help. Yes, but, but it would also give them an enormously larger role than they had before. I mean, a judge who just sits there and applies the laws that have been passed by the legislature has a very minor role. But if he takes the expansive uh, judicial activist role, then of course he's on the leading edge. Similarly with the war on poverty, you, you can show how dependency on government was going down, poverty was going down before this program was ever put in. And within a few years, dependence on government was going up, and after a few more, more years, the absolute number of people in poverty was going up. This was sold to the country, not on the grounds that if you transferred money from A to B, that B would have more money. That was not the argument. The argument was that dependency would be reduced. This will then, you give them job training and all those kinds of things, parenting skills, the whole bit. And this will then be an investment that will pay off in the future because there'll be fewer people dependent upon the government than there were before. And I go through a great number of people from John F. Kennedy to Lyndon Johnson, the New York Times, again, all the usual suspects. The first order of business is to evade the criterion that they themselves set up when they set this out. And so no matter what happens, if, the if, if, it's, if it's a failure by the original criterion, then we just find another criterion by which it will be a success. A lot of the things that, that came out of the Great Society, uh, I mean, building all those junior colleges and community colleges. Oh, I would disagree entirely. I think that was a tragedy of the first That magnitude. was a tragedy. Yes. Why is that a tragedy? You have millions of people who have absolutely no desire for an education using up billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money and not only not getting an education themselves, making it more difficult to give an education to those people who came to college with an idea of getting one. Now, you say they have no desire for an education. I mean, nobody is herding them into these community colleges and into the junior colleges oh. and into the state oh, universities. Oh. I mean, they have a desire, those, obviously. No, they do not, obviously, because lots of things go on in those places that are not education. I mean, where else can you find so many uh, uh, young people of the, of the uh, same age and opposite sex in one place? Uh, a, a nice, convenient place to be. But anyone who is taught in, these, in, in, in a lot of these places, this, this ferocious desire for education as such is not terribly visible. We've set up a society where you have to be credentialed with a certain amount oh, of college, but, so can't, aren't they able to get a better job no, because this, of this their this credentials? No, this is the fallacy of composition. Uh, you know, if, if one person stands up in the stadium, he sees the game better, but if they all stand up, they don't all see the game better. Uh, as long as, you know, if you, have, if you have a degree and the other guy doesn't, then you get ahead of him in the employment line. But we're not going to all get ahead of each other in the employment line by all getting degrees. We have to get more people into the education system because that's the way to compete. And we look at the data and we see 
that uh, the people with more education are earning more money than ever before relative to the people with less education. People who that's all a fallacy of people, everybody standing people, up in the stadium. People, people who fly on the Concord, kids who've flown on the Concord undoubtedly will make more money than people who, kids who've only gone on buses. That does not mean if we put a lot of people on the Concord, we're going to raise the national income. You can't blame the, the crime rate on the fact that there's more poverty, there's less poverty, uh, there's more affluence. It's not due to foreigners because, as you say, we've won the Cold War. Uh, all the normal things that you might blame all this on aren't there. It's not because of diseases, because science has conquered more diseases. It's all because of self-inflicted wounds. And I'm saying these are the people who inflicted those wounds, and this is why we shouldn't listen to them anymore. What are the nature of those wounds? Crime. No, no, no. I, the disintegration of the family. The disintegration of the educational system. And those, and, and it, it's not going to matter. We, we'll be like the man who gained the whole world and lost his soul. I, is there a common root to all of those, uh, all of those problems? It's the notion that ordinary people cannot be trusted to make the decisions that they've been making, but these must be preempted either by judges in the case of crime, uh, by the schools taking over the indoctrination of other people's children behind their back and in, and, and against their uh, protests. Uh, or what was, what, what was the other one, uh, the, the family, uh, putting, uh, taking money from the taxpayers and subsidizing behavior, as well as encouraging it and legitimizing behavior that has turned out to be enormously self-destructive, uh, undermining the family in a thousand different ways. You make this uh, vigorous attack in the vision of the anointed that we should no longer listen to these people. That's sort of the, ba they've been wrong, it's, they don't prove their points, uh, it's hurt us. Who should we listen to? We should listen first and foremost to our own experience. You seem to act as if there must be alternative saviors. We should stop looking for saviors. I mean, the society has not existed for thousands of years because it had a succession of saviors. It's existed because it has institutions and processes through which people can realize their own goals. No, I, I understand that, but, but, y but you are attacking people who, uh, who would like to lead us and tell us how the world works. No, no, they, no, no, they don't want to tell us how the world works. They want to, they want to take over the decision for us. They don't tell the ch parents how they ought to teach sex education to their children. They put this material in the schools behind the backs of the parents with instructions not to let the parents see it. But in, the early, in early America, didn't this sort of educated class make the decisions for everybody? W as far as governmental decisions, yeah. but the government itself didn't make uh, the decisions for everyone. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you know, you, you can't decide where your kid's going to school. You can't decide whether or not they can move a, a halfway house for drug, for drug users next door to you or whatnot. It's out but, of your control. The government that, decides that's that That's right. Stuff. The government decides too many things. They decide also how your children will be raised. Uh, you may have an idea about how, at what age children should be introduced to sex and in what manner, with what kind of moral commitment. You mean so as a parent? You as have a this parent, a parent, yes. Uh, the schools have taken that over. By the time you even think about it, they've already had years, you know, of showing... They're passing out condoms to these kids passing even Passing out condoms you... is not, not even the half of it. Uh, they're, they're showing uh, motion pictures of naked couples engaging in sex, both homosexual and heterosexual, in the seventh grade. And if you complain about it, that's, that's considered to be censorship. You don't, you, you can't pull your kid out of school and say they don't have to put up with this stuff? I guess you could, no. but you'd be... Uh... Well, if you have a private school to put him in, but you have compulsory attendance laws, and if you don't have the money for private schools, then you're stuck. Where did this country get off the track and decide that the federal government should make most of our decisions? Well, it started to some extent in the New Deal, but I think the 1960s is sort of the golden age, if you want to put it that way, of this whole mindset. And that's what the book's about. It's about a mindset. It's not about a series of policies but of showing how in policy after policy, those who think a certain way will uh, try to take over other people's decisions. How do you characterize the liberal philosophy today from the conservative philosophy? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess the main thing about the liberals, again, is that they think a program will do it. If there's something that they don't like in the society, you have set up a program and that will solve the problem. Uh, I think one of the things that, one of the words they use a lot is solutions. And I argue here and elsewhere that there are no, there are no solutions. There are just trade-offs. So, for example, when uh, Ralph Nader launched his attack against the Corvair many years ago, he said it's an unsafe car and it does the, has these safety problems and those safety problems. And in some respects, the, uh, he was correct, not all. Uh, but the fact is, there were other things that a Corvair would do that made it safer than other cars. 
uh, and on net balance, it was as safe as the rest of them. Are you saying there are no solutions to our problems as Americans? There are no solutions to anybody's problems. There are trade-offs. You know, um, safety is a classic example. Uh, every, every, every year, so many hundreds of thousands of people are uh, vaccinated against uh, measles, smallpox, those kinds of things. Now, this saves several hundred lives that it's estimated. It also causes brain damage to about 30 kids a year. Now, there are no solutions in that. There are just trade-offs. What about but, crime? Take crime as an issue. Can we solve the crime issue or fundamentally solve it so it's reduced? Well, then that, that's, just, that, that's, that's, a, that's a trade-off. You, know, you, know, you, don't, you don't solve it. There will always be crime. There always has been. Uh, but you want to keep it down to some level that's not this astronomical thing we have today. Uh, for example, the people, the, the liberals right now are saying, you know, crime is eased off uh, in New York, and that's true. Uh, there, were, there were six times as much crime in New York a few years ago as there was in 1960. Now it's down to five times as much crime as there was in 1960. Now, that's not what I regard as a great, as a great, as a great trend, unless it continues a lot, a lot, a lot more sharply. Well, liberals think we need more education, and we need to help people in the inner city more to cut down crime there. Uh, Conservatives would say we have to be tougher on crime. Is either of them correct? Or oh, I, I, I no. See, you see, the conservative view is really not a not a solution. It's a it's a trade off. It says yes, it would be wonderful if we could do all these things to prevent crime in the first place. We just don't happen to be that smart. And so what we do, we put people behind bars who commit violent crimes. Now, a few years ago in East Palo Alto, which is not far from Stanford University, a minority community, low income, they had the doubtful distinction of being the murder capital of the United States in proportion to their population. Uh, the next year, murder and all sorts of other violent crimes dropped tremendous amount, 30, 40, 50 percent in one year. Now, that wasn't because they discovered the root causes of crime or because they worked out everything that was wonderful. They launched a campaign that put a lot of the bad guys behind bars. And when they were behind bars, they didn't commit as many crimes. <laughs> that uh, makes sense to me. And, and the thing that this, 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 this marvelous, you know, even in a high crime area, the great majority of the people are not criminals. And so if you can just put your hands on those people who are raising all the, all the hell in the community and take them out of circulation, the crime rate drops. People say there's undue uh, emphasis on African Americans for committing crimes. Is that true? Uh, Ed Koch know, wrote an all column here that the population is 25 percent African American in New York. 62 percent of the crimes are committed by African Americans. Is that a, and he says... I haven't, I haven't checked his figures, but, but yeah, throughout the world, this is, this is, this is not, not unusual, throughout the world, people are disproportionately represented in all kinds of different things. And it's true, obviously, in basketball. It's true in all kinds of other things. Uh, the main thing is not, is not to keep people out of jail because they're one race or another, because when you do that, the people who are going to suffer the most will be the black community. Where are you on affirmative action? Against. Why? Well, you can only do one of two things. You can either just uh, judge people individually or you can judge them by groups. This whole notion that you're going to come out with a compromise, I would defy anybody to come out with a compromise on that. You're going to do one of those two things. Now, you can pretend to be doing other things, but that's all you're going to do. That's, those are the only two choices you really have in the end. Uh, again, the people who are the anointed think of this as a symbolic issue, and they want to be on the side of the angels. They don't ask, what are the consequences? Now, I've studied affirmative action programs around the world. One of the consequences is that those people who are more fortunate in the group that has the preferences, those people take the lion's share of the preferences. Very often, those at the other end of the scale, the poorer people, uh, actually fall further behind. That's true of black share. It's true of Malays in Malaysia. It's true of various groups in India. Uh, and there are reasons for that. Uh, you know, you, you can say you must have certain proportion. Nothing is easier than for an employer who, would, who might otherwise locate, let's say, in the Bronx, to locate out in Provo, Utah, where he will be not near any black people, and therefore he will never have lawsuits, and the jobs will be in Provo, and people will wonder why don't people, you know, uh, here have more jobs. Uh, it never seems to occur to, to liberals that other people are not blocks of wood, that when you set up certain incentives, they will react to them in certain ways. And when they do that, the result may be the opposite of what you set out to do. How do the anointed refer to people they don't agree with? All sorts of ways, but I think the main thing is they believe that uh, you're not merely in error but in sin. In other words, they can't believe that you're just mistaken. Uh, you must have uh, you must have sold out. You must have uh, must be something warped about you. You guys are for the rich. Mm. You guys only care about the rich guys. Mm. Uh, answer that. How do you how do you respond? Liberal says conservatives only care about rich people. Well, one of the things I go into in the book is that the whole notion of rich is ridiculous. Uh, 
that most Americans don't stay in the same income bracket, even for one decade. So the same guy who was, quote, rich now was 20 years ago, probably in the bottom 20 percent. I mean, I was on a cruise recently, a luxury cruise, and the guy said, you know, if so someone had told me when I was growing up that I would end up on a cruise like this, I would have said, get real, man. You know, that uh, very few people are in that same income bracket the whole time. Right. The genuinely rich and the genuinely poor, I would estimate to be no more than 3% of the American people. Really? Put together. Really? Yes. Genuinely poor. Now, they, you know, I'm seeing numbers like... When they were talking about health care, they said, uh, what, 20, 30 million people couldn't afford it or something? That's uh, several million of those were making more than $50,000 a year. So it was not, see, this is one of the things the anointed do. They never believe that people make choices. There are people who, may, who have the money, they, they prefer to put that money into a BMW rather than have rather into A lot of young people didn't want health care. They, they were betting on their health. Uh, absolutely. And yeah. then this allows them to buy more stuff they want to buy. So it's not a question that they couldn't afford it. It's a question they don't choose to spend the money. What about uh, mean-spirited? Conservatives are mean-spirited. They're, they're bigots. They don't like people. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell people, people say, you know, you're, you're, you're a very uh, tough person. I, I'm not tough. Life is tough. I'm merely trying to acquaint you with, the, with those facts. You know, back in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson announced a war on poverty. Mm. Am I wrong, but there are more poor people. I mean, in other words... Today than there were then, yes. Yeah, there are more poor people. Yes. I mean, this was a hell of a war. We lost it, apparently, because for the last 30 years, we've been dumping money into these poverty programs. Oh, absolutely. Where's it, the money go? Oh, it, it, it supports a whole industry of people who uh, run those programs who talk about those programs, research those programs, bureaucrats, and so on. Doesn't help poor people. No. Uh, the tragedy, you see, is that the anointed really want to make symbolic statements. And running these programs makes those symbolic statements. They don't really care if, in the, in the wake of affirmative action, for example, companies start locating away from minority communities so they don't even get involved in, in legal action. They don't care about that. They've made their statement on the side of the angels, and that's what's important. Have you ever debated Jesse Jackson? No, I haven't. Is that because, would you like to, or would he not want to do that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I've You'd seen be willing to, I assume. Oh, I, it, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you think that's too much showbiz? It is. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there are people who go out and do this, and I, I'm doing less and less of it. And I tell them the story of an, of an African uh, boxing champion who fought an Irishman in St. Patrick's Day, Day in Dublin. And he lost his title on what the sports writers called a questionable decision. <laughs> 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 yes. And so you have to know what forum you're talking about. Right. I, was, I, was, I saw Shelby Steele on with him, and I said, you know, if Jesse Jackson and Shelby Steele each had to present a two-hour lecture to an audience with an average IQ of 120, Shelby would wipe him out. But if they had five seconds each on Donahue, it would be Jesse Jackson all the way. Right. So everything depends upon the forum. Uh, is Jesse Jackson good for African Americans or no, not? He's, he's not. good for himself. Good for himself. And that's true of most ethnic leaders in most groups in most countries in most period of, periods of history. That what will make what will serve his interest is to keep people paranoid, dependent upon him, dependent upon government. What will serve their interest is typically just the opposite. Whew. That's pretty interesting. So you're saying that the the leaders, whatever group, yeah. whatever yeah. leader wants the people to be poor and dependent on them as opposed to dependent on themselves. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, you see this in the greatest cynicism in the academic world, where in many places, uh, black uh, organizations on campus have a say on who gets admitted. And they have turned down blacks with excellent credentials, both as students and as faculty members. Uh, for that very reason. Who are the mascots of the anointed? You talk about the mascots of the anointed. They're people whom, whom they choose to um, back and whose rights are supposed to override other people's rights. The homeless are a classic example. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled when I see people out there in the street uh, giving money to the, to the home. I'm mean, able-bodied men. Yeah. I think one of the classic pictures to me uh, was in San Francisco when there was this uh, able-bodied white man out in the street begging, and there's this black lady coming along there, uh, very modestly dressed like she didn't have, but she's stopping to open her purse to give him some money, you know. And I thought, good heavens, have we really come to this? And we've been brainwashed by the anointed into thinking this is what we ought to do. What do you say to guys who bum money off of you? Not all of it can be repeated on, on, on the air, <laughs> but the fact is they don't get any money. They don't. And, I, and people who complain now about all these people begging in the street, there's a simple answer. Don't give them money, and they won't be in the street. When you wrote this, what were you trying to accomplish with the book, and did you do it? Did, were you nailing liberals 
for 30 years of social policy. What were you trying to say? I was trying to reveal the thinking behind that, the kinds of assumptions, the kind of world that exists inside their mind, and therefore why those assumptions are so dangerous in the long run. It's not just the policies mentioned in, those, in that, in that they book. They think they're better than everybody else. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Uh, and that's what makes them dangerous. Uh, even all the policies that are mentioned there, 20 years from now, those policies may not be the policies we're concerned about. But that mindset will still be there. And what makes them tremendously dangerous is that facts that contradict what they believe are simply ignored or evaded. Where does the press fall into this as the United Group? Are they part of the United? Oh, absolutely. They're a major part of it because one of the reasons that people don't get many of the facts that go against what's believed is that the press doesn't choose to publicize those facts. Give me an example of something the press might not cover or cover well. Oh, a few years, a few years ago there was a story about um, prenatal care among blacks, that black women get less prenatal care than white women. Infant mortality rate is higher among blacks. They immediately assume that one causes the other. Now, I, now I, one of the things I like to do is go back to the original source and find out what it said. I went back. On the very same page where it said that, it sh the, the figure showed Mexican-Americans get even less prenatal care than blacks, and they have a lower infant mortality rate than whites. So infant mort prenatal care and infant mortality rate have nothing to do with each other. If you break it down further, uh, black women who have only a high school education but who are married, their children have lower infant mortality rates than white women who have a college education who are unwed mothers. So it's not race, it's not income, it's not education, it's lifestyle. When you live a certain way, there are consequences to that. The media doesn't want to want to, want to accept that. Because if you say people's lifestyles have a lot to do with the outcome, then there's no room for the anointed. 